week 27, I'm going to do worship at the end. We're going to, we're in week 27 of Story Through the Bible, and we have switched from the Old Testament to the New. So welcome to Christmas in July, because we're going to talk about the birth of Jesus. So I almost wore like a Christmas sweater, but it's like, yeah, it's any number of colloquial things, and then Corey would punch me, and that would just not be pretty, and yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you would enjoy it. <laughs> All right, so Jesus' birth, um, theme is Jesus born in Bethlehem. About four centuries after the last Old Testament book was written, the long-awaited Messiah was born. Prophets had foretold many details about his life and ministry, so expectations for a deliverer often burned brightly in Israel, which was now under Roman domination. But no one knew exactly what kind of Messiah to expect or specifically when he would come. Two of the gospel writers tell us the story of his birth. So just a quick synopsis. About 400 years that we know of, God was silent. There were no prophets, there were no new books written, and there was a lot of history that happened in those 400 years. Israel was conquered at least four different times by four different um, empires, the latest being Rome. And so after 400 years of silence from God and just going and being conquered and being an oppressed people, they were desperately seeking the Messiah and they were clinging to God's word, which is great. But that also meant that they had a lot of preconceived notions of what Jesus was going to be. And I don't want to get ahead because really that applies more to how he was crucified and his disciples and doesn't really apply here. But People were expecting the Messiah to be a conqueror, not a savior, in the sense that we know him as savior. They expect him to come overthrow the Romans, set them free, and set up rule, and that's not how those work. You may remember that one of God's, promise, one of God's promises after Adam and Eve sinned was that he would send someone to tread on the serpent's head. Thousands of years later, God sent Jesus into the world as our savior. Notice as you listen to the story how special Jesus' birth was. Also think about these questions. What kind of people did God choose to be earthly parents of his son? And what kind of people did God choose to be the first to receive his good news? God sent the angel Gabriel to a young woman named Mary who had never been married. Gabriel greeted her by telling her she was highly favored by the Lord and that the Lord was with her. This troubled Mary. She didn't know why she was greeted this way. The angel told her not to be afraid, and again, she had found favor with God. He told her she would have a child and that he would, she should name him Jesus. He will be great and be called Son of the Most High, Gabriel said. He would reign on the throne of King David, his ancestor, and his kingdom would never end. Quick little side note on the name Jesus. That's actually the Greek interpretation of Yeshua, which in the Old Testament in Hebrew was Joshua, what we know as Joshua. So... Um, There are a lot of interesting parallels if you ever want to study it on the life of Joshua and Jesus and how God even displayed um, some of what we should expect in Jesus through the life of Joshua as a savior and deliverer. Back to the story. Mary wondered how this could be because she was a virgin, obviously. Gabriel told her that the Holy Spirit would overshadow her, that he would be the father of the child. Then the angel told her how her relative Elizabeth was going to have a child in her old age who would be John the Baptist because nothing is impossible with God. I love this response of Mary. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it to be as you have said. Then the angel left her. Now, if you look back at the story of John the Baptist and Zechariah, Zechariah went back and forth so much with the angel that the angel said, because you've not believed me, you're going to be mute until the child's born and then you have on the flip side you have mary said okay may it be to me as you've said i mean that's that's faith that's fantastic faith when joseph mary's future husband found out mary was pregnant he planned to quietly send her away but an angel appeared to him in a dream and explained that the child was conceived by the holy spirit she will give birth to a son the angel said and you are to give him the name jesus yeshua because he will save his people from their sins This fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy that a virgin would give birth to a child and his name would be Emmanuel, or God with us. Joseph was familiar with the scriptures and knew of the prophecy. So when he woke up, he did what the angel said and took Mary as his wife. I'm going to pause there um, and just talk a little bit about the 
the process of marriage back in those days um, because it's really interesting how they did. Uh, and I printed off an article, so I am cheating a little bit. Um, marriage took place at a young age. For most guys, they were about 18. The girls, as soon as they were of childbearing age, around 13, they were married. Okay, And usually, those marriages were arranged. So the son would be working usually under his father's trade or in his family business or on the family farm. And the parents would go and try to set him up with a nice girl, usually within the same community, within the same tribe, and try to have it arranged. So it was marriages were not based on, oh, I dated you, I courted you, I love you, now let's get married. It's, it was more of a, you're going to marry Shamil's daughter, and she'll, I think she'll be a good wife for you, and you'll be a good husband for her, and la-da-da. And so oftentimes, they didn't even see each other till the wedding. So, just giving ahead on my notes here. So once the future bride had been chosen for a young man, either by his parents or more rarely by himself, sometimes he would, there would be a period of a year called betrothal. During this period, the couple lived apart while often negotiations were occurred uh, around like bride price and things like that. And bride price wasn't, he was buying her as a slave. Um, it was often the father of the daughter was setting, trying to establish that his daughter is extremely valuable. And that, um, one, you're also compensating the family for the loss of help because the girls and the women did a lot of the work around the house. And so by taking this daughter out of his house, there's one less person doing chores. All very not American these days, but that's just the way it was back then. It was also understood that some money should be set aside for the woman to protect her in the event of her husband's death. So her father is taking care of all of this, right? You're going to compensate me, you're, you know, pride price for my daughter, but you're also going to make sure that we have some stuff set aside, that she has something to subsist on if you die because women had no rights and without either their father or a husband or a son to care for them, they were in a bad, bad situation. And so the betrothal period, during this time too, the husband's going back and he's preparing himself and his He's preparing a place for them to live, usually on his parents' property. Usually they would build onto the house or they would build onto the family farm. But he's also preparing himself financially to be able to take a year off because it was custom, and I don't remember if it's law or not, that, the, that when you're married, the man would take a year from any responsibility to be with his wife. And so he also had to go back and prepare for all of that. He had to make sure everything was set up, that he would be able to survive for a year while um, they were celebrating that first year. At the conclusion of the betrothal period, when all the agreements were signed, the wedding would occur. Weddings at that time t typically extended over five to seven days. Autumn was the best time for marriages because the harvest was in, the vintage was over, minds were free, and hearts were at rest. Things were all taken care of. Everything was done. It was a season when evenings were cool, making it pleasant to sit up late at night. In small villages, the entire community would usually gather to celebrate. On the evening before the first day of the wedding feast, the bridegroom, accompanied by his friends, went to fetch his betrothed from her father's house. He would wear particularly splendid clothes and sometimes even a crown. A procession was formed under the direction of one of the bridegroom's friends who acted as a master of ceremonies and remained by his side throughout the rejoicing. You guys seeing some of the stuff that... Jesus talked about in some of his parables. Uh, you don't know the name of the hour of the day. The bride didn't know typically what day the bridegroom was going to show up. All of this just, he showed up. He, they had a, um, a litter for her, so it was, they were somewhat kind of treated like royalty. He was wearing a crown. It was a big deal to the community. Everybody celebrated. It was a bit of a parade. And the bride be, would get beautifully dressed carried in a litter, and along the way, people sang wedding songs drawn from Song of Songs in the Bible, which, if you can understand it, you're a better person than me. Um, skipping ahead. When the procession reached the bridegroom's house, his parents uttered a traditional blessing drawn from Scripture and other sources. The remainder of the evening was passed in games and dancing, with the bridegroom taking part. The bride, however, withdrew with her friends and bridemaids to another room. The next day, the great wedding feast came. 
Once again, there was general rejoicing and a sort of holiday in the village. Towards the end of the day, there was a meal. Men and women were served apart. That was the time for the giving of presents. Usually the bridesmaids stood around the bride, who was all dressed in white, and there were usually ten of them. The bride sat under a canopy while traditional songs were sung and blessings were cited. In the evening, the groom arrived, and while the exact ritual words are not certain, there seems to be some dialogue between the bride and groom, which is recorded in the Song of Songs, which I'm not going to read all of that right now. Now that the couple was together, all the, men and women, all the men and women in attendance were together as well. Religious leaders imparted blessings on the couple who were now together under the canopy. The words of these blessings are not known and seem to have varied. After these blessings came the evening feast. Later on that first evening, the couple retired and the marriage was consummated. The celebration often, con often continued for several more days. The couple didn't go on a honeymoon, but were made for the duration sharing in the merriment. And sometimes it would be in multiple villages. If they were from two different places, they celebrate in one place for several days, they go to the next for several days and celebrate. It was a very big deal. Um... So all of this is, is kind of setting context for where Joseph and Mary were. They were betrothed. So in the eyes of Israel, they were contractually married. They weren't married, but they, were, they belonged to each other. They were legally, just not spiritually or physically married yet. Okay? So all of that sets a tone because all of a sudden, Mary's pregnant. So take a step back from knowing what we know from the angels how does that look to the community she cheated right so what would have happened what what was what was culturally supposed to happen if she had created had committed adultery she would have, it would have stoned her now there's two requirements for that to happen one of two ways that ad adultery would be determined and then stoning would be carried out one is if three witnesses caught them in the act of adultery. And usually, not only the woman, but the man would be punished as well. Two, the husband in this situation could say, she's been unfaithful and provides some reasonable evidence for it, and in which case she'd be stoned. So one of the, those are the one of the two ways that adultery was established in Israel at the time and stoning carried out. So we know the one more familiarly because of Jesus with the woman caught in the act of adultery. Which also makes me wonder, they're like r bands of roving people going around watching and trying to bust people in the act. I, anyways, so, well, that too. So, all right, let me get back to my notes here. Okay. So, he took Mary as his wife. Now, in the sense that he brought her into his home. Okay, the Bible clearly states that they had no relations until after the child was born. And this fulfilled a, a, a requirement that the Savior would be of a virgin birth. So not only was she a virgin when the child was conceived, she was a virgin when the child was still born. And that was important. Um, several months later, Joseph and Mary had to travel to Bethlehem of Judea, their ancestral town. Because Caesar Augustus had ordered a census... While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. The town was crowded with people registering for the census. For the census. Yeah. So Joseph and Mary had to stay where the animals were kept because there was no room for them in the inn. Mary gave birth to Jesus, wrapped him in cloth, and placed him in a manger, the animal's feeding trough. So a couple of points there. One, kind of going back to the scandal around Joseph and Mary, right? So, I've already kind of laid out that all Joseph had to say was she was unfaithful, provide proof she would have been stoned. But because he was a righteous man, he decided, I'm just going to divorce her quietly and really saying, now she's her dad's problem. Right? Give the bride price back, whatever would happen. But instead of making a public spectacle, a man could just write a certificate of divorce and just divorce the wife. And so that was what he had in mind until the angel intervened. Now, why wasn't she stoned for being unwed, unwed and pregnant? It's because if she wasn't betrothed, but she was pregnant, that wasn't necessarily a stonable sin. Adultery was, but fornication, and while still a sin, 
There wasn't a mandate for stoning. Um, two, I mean, she wasn't guilty of adultery. I gave you the requirements for being, to be found guilty. And as for the final bit, when he accepted her, he basically, some of the community would probably assume, okay, well, he really was the dad. And so there's a lot of, of cultural controversy that surrounded that that you don't really see in the Bible. But, okay, well, you were betrothed to her, but then you got her pregnant before the marriage ceremony. This is not cool. But um, anyways, oh, and the final bit, the reason why there, there was likely some controversy for Joseph as well is because if he's going to his ancestral home, it's reasonably assumed that he's got family there, right? Why wouldn't he be staying with family? And one commentator said, and I, I wasn't able to do a lot of research, so let's just put this with a grain of salt of, I got one source on it, is that this, uh, the, when they talked about no room in the inn or putting her in the inn, it was like putting her in the garage or the lower room instead of the upper room, which, is, which was the more respectable place. So there's some thought that they were with family, but the family consigned them because of the controversy to the stables. Um, like I said, there's one place I found that. I didn't get to dig into that a whole lot, so do your own research on that one. Um, that night, an angel appeared to shepherds who were out in nearby fields keeping watch over their flocks. The sight of the angel bathed in God's glory terrified the shepherds, but the angel told them not to be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. He said, he declared that a savior, the Messiah, had been born that day in Bethlehem, King David's ancestral city. They would recognize the savior by this. They would find a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger. Then more angels suddenly appeared and they were praising God saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, bless you, peace to men on whom his favor rests. After the angels left, the shepherds went to Bethlehem to see the baby. They found, bless you. They found Mary and Joseph and Jesus, and they spread the word about what they had heard and seen. Everyone who listened to them was amazed. The shepherds returned to the fields, praising God, and Mary treasured these things in her heart. So, why shepherds? Mm -hmm. Does God do anything the way we expect him to? More often than not, he doesn't, though. Sometimes he does, but more often than not, he doesn't. And if he does it the way we expect it, it's because we see example of it in the Word, right? So, they found the baby wrapped in cloths. An interesting bit, they would have recognized the cloths because one of the things the shepherds did is the priests would give them these cloths because part of the law was the firstborn male sheep was to be what? sacrificed but they had to be what faultless without blemish so if you have this this baby being born you're going to basically put it in the bubble wrap of the day right you're going to wrap it up and so they would wrap it up in these cloths that were given to them by the priests to protect them and so here you have jesus being wrapped in swaddling cloths that were intended for firstborn sheep to put him in a manger so you also have the perfect Lamb of God, the firstborn Son, who will be sacrificed, wrapped in the cloths, intended for a lamb to be sacrificed. Um, okay. Moving along a little faster than I thought, so this is great. Okay. So let's move in some questions. How did, angel get, how did the angel Gabriel greet Mary? Why do you think Mary was highly favored and why, why did he think that you call, he called her highly favored? Mm -hmm.
How can you not be favored if you're going to have God's son? Mm -hmm. Which is interesting, because were women really educated in that day? No. All the boys went to Hebrew school until the age of 12. So Joseph would have known and been very familiar with the word. Memorizing the entire um, Pentateuch was part of the requirement of Hebrew school. So all Hebrew boys were very familiar with the word. Mary would have had to try to get it where she could. Likely her father taught her. Maybe she had brothers that taught her. Things like that. That was how women were able to learn the word. And then whatever they obviously heard in um, temple. I'm trying to think of the other one. Tavern. Yeah. That. At church. <laughs> that one place that they would go every week in the town. Huh? Synagogue. synagogue. That's the word I was looking for. The synagogue. It's been a long day, folks. I'm sorry. <laughs> the brain is... Come on. What did Gabriel tell her about Jesus? And then what did the angel who appeared to Joseph tell him about Jesus? To be the son of God? What does his name mean? No, Emmanuel means God with us. What does Yeshua mean? Savior, deliverer. He would save people from their sins. Okay, this one's kind of an obvious one. In, which, in what way was Jesus' birth a miracle? What plans do you think Mary had for her life? Not a whole lot. She's betrothed to a carpenter, right? Probably not. Was Nazareth, Nazareth a big deal? What good could come from Nazareth? So you're talking like, I don't know, name that town that we all look down upon around the area, right? Pacific. Can you th <laughs> Anything good come out of Catawissa? Whatever. So, anyways, St. Clair. I'll pick on my town. Can anything good come out of St. Clair? No, not really. Jury's still out on me. Um... But so a, no, a nowhere place with a nobody couple. And her plans in life were probably just, I'm going to marry Joseph. I'm going to take care of his home. I'm going to bear his kids. And that's all there is to it. Not a whole lot to look forward to. So all of a sudden, an angel of God completely 180s her life. And not only that, you had, you had to think that she would know the controversy that would arise around this situation. You are going to bear God's son. How can this be? Because I'm a virgin. Okay. So you had to know that she's got to be thinking in the back of her mind, I still got to talk to my, I can tell my parents this. And we don't get to see how the parents reacted. We just see Mary and Joseph. But you have to imagine the parents were like, what? Come again? Hold on. What? And no, to our knowledge, no angel appeared to them. Did they take her at a word? Did they believe her? Or did they put her out? She lived in their household. They would have had to know, right? What's that, Lonnie? Zachariah. Oh, that's a good point. She was starting to show a little bit. Let's die down the controversy a little bit. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> you can only hide it for so long. So, yeah, just so many things that we don't see in the word that when you, when you look at the context of the culture at the time, they really took on a lot and had to have a lot of faith in what God was going to put them through. Mm. 
Ja. Ja. That's a good point, too. And just to celebrate, I mean, that's a big deal with Elizabeth, right? So very similar stories, but kind of different outcomes. You know, Elizabeth had John the Baptist, and he was, you know, he was the announcer that he, he set the way for the Messiah. Mary was giving birth to Messiah. But you have to imagine that the pregnancy and everything around that, and even after the child was born, was probably brought with controversy. They were probably shunned a little bit by the community. Because no matter how many people you tell and try to convince, we all know that not everybody's going to buy it. And people like to talk, and they love to talk then. And that's a culture where everything was about face. Everything was about honor. Everything was about how things appeared, how things looked. Everything was about saving face. And so the pregnancy, the birth, all controversial. They're in Bethlehem. Herod finds out. They have to flee. So they, they've left everything in Nazareth to go to Bethlehem for what they thought was a short period of time. Had a kid. Was told to flee to Egypt. Stayed in Egypt for a couple of years. Were able to come back. And hopefully by then, controversy died down a little bit. Probably when they got back, they did a little bit of talk. But after a while, people just probably let it go. So they probably had a period where everything was fine. But then Jesus goes out in ministry. At some point, Joseph dies. And so Mary's on her own. At least that's what we believe because we see nothing of jo- Joseph in the, in the narrative once he's an adult. And so he goes out in ministry. Mary probably tagged along with him um, for most of it or was at home with his brothers and taking care of them. We're not really sure. We see her show up some points in the life of Jesus and more often after. But um, you can kind of surmise. So he leaves, and then she knows because the angel told her, will save the people from their sin she gets to watch her son die so extremely difficult parenthood I mean granted probably for I mean at the age of 12 he disappears to the temple right <laughs> so she's having a heart attack for three days because I'm raising God's son and I've lost God's son well let's be real I've lost God's kid this is great So, anyways. What challenges do you think Joseph faced because of God's plan? Right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, how would you potty train Jesus? <laughs> well, he, he never sinned, but it doesn't say that he wasn't. He still feel fully human. It's, I, have to, I have to believe that Jesus was a little bit of, had fun with people at times, a, a little bit of a stinker at times. I mean, come on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And the and the word says he grew up in favor with God and men, right? Um Absolutely, and let's be, let's be honest. No matter how strong of a faith you have, you're not going. 
you can't tell me he didn't have periods where he's like moments of doubt. Like, is, is this really of God? What, did I eat some bad challah when I went to sleep and just dreamt the angel? Like, you know, like. They, they preempted the wedding night. Mm-hmm. This is true. Probably. I, I have to go with you on that one. I mean... Well, yeah. You're telling me you're giving birth to God's son? Yeah. It was it. I mean, was it in, yeah, was it like some big loud proclamation or was it like just an aside conversation like we have in the foyer before Sunday service, right? Like, we all don't hear all the conversations that happen out there. Yeah. So. Yes. Mary. Yeah. Well, and being a woman, unfortunately, she had no credibility in the eyes of the religious leaders. So... And I believe it was um, Anna that said Aunt Mary's heart would be pierced as well. Prophesying that she was likely going to see the death of her son. So, good conversation. I love Christmas. I do. It's July. It's hotter than all. Get out outside and we're talking about Christmas. So let's let's discuss a little bit more. Why do you think God chose the shepherds? You know, we talked about God doesn't do things typically, but what else about shepherds is significant in the announcement of Jesus' birth? Who is Jesus descended from? What did David do? He was a shepherd. Additionally, Shepherds being culturally probably the lowest of the low. Um, one is significant because God, like you said, God sought out the poor and the humble of heart. Um, but two, they didn't have anything to lose in proclaiming that Christ was born. You know, if it was a religious leader that the angels appeared to. Think, I mean, think about how they, how visceral the Pharisees and the Sadducees were. Even Jesus healing on the Sabbath, 
right? They were so focused on the rules. So if he would appear, if God would have appeared to, you know, a Pharisee, one of the priests, I'm not going to go and tell everybody because he, he knows that he could be treading on blasphemy with his contemporaries. You know, he didn't go to Herod because, let's face it, Herod was a wicked puppet king. So he's not going to announce to a king, but he goes to the, the, the shepherds who, in all likelihood, everything I've ever studied about, you know, the culture of that time, they were what you imagine, rough and rowdy. I mean, they were like our truckers of our day, right? They're just kind of rough, rowdy, direct to the point, and and all of that. And so, what do they have to lose? They're going to proclaim it. Jesus is a good shepherd. Mm-hmm. He did. The, par- the parable of the 99 all that Hmm. yep Well, that's true, and I, I, you know, I hadn't put that together, but that's a good point because that's also back when we talked about the Exodus and the Israelites. The reason why the Israelites were in Goshen and not in with the rest of the Egypt because Egyptians looked down on shepherds, which is what they were at the time. So even the history of God's people is around shepherds. So that's a good point. That's why I love these conversations because it clicks things that you don't even think about. So how does the story of Jesus' birth relate to the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Got a plan for the beginning. Because if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned, Jesus wouldn't have been necessary. So, but, and that, that's, that's another thing. I was having a conversation, I think, with Chloe, talking about all of that in the fall. And, uh, you know, one thing the Bible doesn't tell us is how long from when they were created to when the fall happened. Was it a few days? Was it weeks? Was it years? Hundreds of years. We don't know. We just go from presentation of Eve and naming the animals and all of a sudden boom the fall true yeah absolutely at least five days (laughs) what you got Because for this sacrifice, and I'd have to, sorry, my mind's jumping all over the place. Bear with me here. Um, I forget where in the scripture um, it talks about it, but the Messiah had to be fully God and fully man, or it had to be the perfect sacrifice, and the perfect sacrifice had to be human, which is why Mary was involved. Um, it couldn't be through a husband because then, um, he would have been fully human and not God and therefore have a sinful nature. Um, but you know, why wasn't he just created out of the dust? Because he had to have, had to be born of a human. And I forget where the prophecies talk about that, but there's a couple places in the Old Testament. Lonnie, you might know it more than I do. What's that? They were created human.
solve the problem? No, go for it. But I think part of his question is why did, he, why did God wait so long for Jesus to come? We're talking thousands of years, right? Is that kind of what you were getting at? Yeah, but why not, why not just have Jesus show up right then and there, like be the first kid of Adam and Eve and then go? Yes.
did.